Welcome to the Ocular Surface Academy podcast, TFOS Dues 2 edition. Join us as we meet with the researchers behind this landmark international consensus. Each episode will feature practical clinical takeaways. Before we get to today's episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor. At Kala, we know that very often eye diseases aren't just pain, they can be life limiting for patients. Because diseases like dry eye can have severe physical and emotional consequences. So we committed to helping these patients. We assembled an unmatched team of eye care professionals. We pioneered a whole new technology for ocular medicine. We developed and launched the first BID steroid for post-operative pain and inflammation following ocular surgery. And we are now launching the first and only prescription therapy specifically designed to address the short-term treatment needs for people living with dry eye disease. We are Kala Pharmaceuticals, and we are committed to advancing the treatment of eye diseases. We are creating our own trigger, and now we are at the beginning of the next chapter in our exciting journey together. Welcome your host and co-host for today's episode of the Ocular Service Academy podcast, Dr. Scott Schachter and Dr. Christopher Starr. So welcome back everybody to the second part of our definition and classification discussion of TFOS DUES 2. Welcome back, Dr. Jennifer, our professor, and Dr. Jennifer mm-hmm. Craig, and Dr. Kelly Nichols, mm-hmm. and Dr. Chris Starr. We discussed the first go round the, the evolution of the definition of dry eye from a disorder or sort of a nuisance disease state or nuisance state to a, a disease state. And I want to jump into the breakdown when you looked at the first definition from the original TFOS 2007 to 2017 looking for, for what you needed to modify. We talked about punctuation being critical. <laughs> and I, 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 I think of this meme and how important these things are when you have the sentence, let's eat, comma, grandma, and then you take the, the comma away and then you've got a whole different story, right? So, so punctuation matters, right? It's really important, which seems to be a lost art in the, in the days of texting. So we have a whole new way of looking at, at those things. So, so let me ask you, and I want you to tell me a lot about your experiences, but, but when I looked at this new definitions, the things that struck me as a practitioner, the recognition of neurosensory component of a lacrimal function unit, I thought that was a big, big deal. The change from aqueous insufficiency and evaporative dry being mutually exclusive or sort of a bifurcation into a continuum, that mattered. One thing that I'd like your opinions on was was the, you, you talk about patient symptoms, but was there ever any discussion of adding the effect on quality of life and, and Jennifer, you had mentioned, let me start with you, you had mentioned this sort of was a patient-centric yeah. process. Where, so was so that ever you, part of it? Well, I mean, yeah, certainly quality of life is important. But you know, as, as we've talked about, the it's very much our definition, our classification, everything to do with TFOS Jews 2 is evidence-based. So it's the amount of information that's um, in the literature. So we do have a, a growing literature on the impact on quality of life. We know for patients with dry eye, with severe dry eye, it has the same kind of impact on quality of life as those suffering from angina. And I think of you or those undergoing regular dialysis, for example, and you talk about a patient that has something like that and people go, oh, that's terrible. What a massive inconvenience and impact on life that is. And people don't realize that's the same for dry eyes. So, yes, it is important, but it's not specifically mentioned in the definition because we can't include everything. But in terms of our symptoms, that, that would come in under that as well. We would be looking at everything um, that impacts on a patient. So understanding what happens to a patient we thought was very important. And so for the first time in the TFOS Jews 2 classification, there was a new patient-centered flowchart put up at the beginning. We, we thought we'd start with the patient rather than simply starting from 
the diagnosis of dry eye. So previously we had dry eye and then you saw the bifurcation as you described into aqueous deficiency and evaporative dry eye. And interestingly about that, actually, it wasn't ever, we, we never ever said it was mutually exclusive. That was something that people just imagined. And I guess it was from that bifurcation. And it was something that Kelly was very keen on and quite rightly so when we came to redo the you know, the, the classification and looking at the breakdown between aqueous deficiency and evaporative, that we somehow managed to depict the fact that it's not mutually exclusive. It never has been, but it was misinterpreted in that way. And that's where we came up with the spectrum, where it goes from one end to the other. And I'll have Kelly talk about that in a little bit. But yeah, in addition to that, it was adding on that patient-centred flowchart to lead to the point where you get to a dry eye diagnosis. And so that, yeah, that's that the, the patient-centred part. Starting with a patient, what do they have? Do they have signs? Do they have symptoms? We need to have, in, in dry eye, we recognise that patients needed to have both. If we make it purely a symptomatic definition everybody has dry eye it's not specific enough so you need to have signs as well so it's signs and symptoms and so with that patient flow chart what we have is saying well what do patients have because we recognize there are patients with signs and no symptoms or symptoms without signs they're not dry eye patients it was make, making sure that didn't become the diagnosis the diagnosis was only those with signs and symptoms but recognizing that the other people are there and we still need to manage them as clinicians we need to make a decision about how we're going to manage them but for many different reasons and as we mentioned in the last um, podcast making sure that when we're running clinical trials making sure that we choose the right patient group in order to test our different products is highly critical and so that's what that first part is about and looking at the, uh, the patient flow chart from the moment you have a patient deciding on their symptoms, deciding on their signs, and then feeding them through into one of four different options. And I'll let Kelly talk about some of those four options that we have. Having a patient-centered flowchart for classification is very unusual. And uh, we went round and round about this because most times when you have a definition, and this gets to your quality of life question, Scott, when you have a definition you know, it's very specific to what's happening related to the disease state and, you know, looking at the tissues that might be impacted, et cetera, if you're thinking about um, other, you know, definitions of diseases. And so they don't have usually a place for the consequences of the diseases like quality of life, usually. And so adding something like quality of life in a definition would be very against normal definition rules, per se, if you want to say there are any to having a definition because it's a, a downstream effect. Even having the symptom part in there is a bit unusual because we don't have too many symptom-based diseases. They're pathology-based definitions usually. And likewise, there are pathology-based classification schemes. So it may be an overall classification. And then if you see this variant or that variant or this variant in terms of a, a pathophysiological change, then that usually is used to classify things differently. So when we started to think about that relative to dry eye, dry eye just didn't fall into that flow scheme. You couldn't think of um, different types of things that might fall out. Now, in the original classification scheme that Jenny was mentioning, there were two boxes. One said aqueous deficiency and the other one said evaporative. And if you read the text of that document, it very much described how you could have one or you could have the other, or you could have both. But the picture is what lived and lived on in sort of perpetuity. You would always see that picture and very rarely see the, the paragraph that went with that photograph in the 10 years that went on after that original document was, was published. So we wanted to get away from that, that in a, you imagine a lecture scenario where the, the graphic was shown and the words were missing and the interpretation of who was giving that lecture was there. We wanted to get away from the fact that aqueous deficient and evaporative could be perceived as being um, separate buckets. And so again, that goes against the rules usually of typical classification schemes. So we, so we threw it all out and started over because we felt like starting from scratch and starting from the patient would be the right approach as Jenny mentioned in terms of making a classification scheme that could be used by a clinician in practice. Mm -hmm. You know, do they have signs? Do they have symptoms? You know, so you start with the symptoms. Do they have symptoms? Yes or no. And 
if you notice in the picture, there is a way out. You can have, <laughs> you can be asymptomatic and have no signs and be normal. And that, and then you exit sort of stage, you know, left on our diagram, but you could, you would, you could get out of this diagram the easy way. And then if you have symptoms or don't have symptoms, it runs you down into either dry or not, you know, dry eye. And if you had, you know, which, which you were, and there are implications to clinical practice for all of those elements. The easiest way is if you had signs and symptoms and you were a definite dry eye. But the one that was the most interesting was the neuropathic pain group and the neurosensory pathway of having symptoms, but no signs. And honestly, we felt like there was sort of a big black box around that at the time, because we really don't know that much about that, even, even now, a few years after the definition has been published. So when we were making the definition, you know, we were trying to think, should we add this or not? Because we're an evidence-based approach and we have some evidence, but how strong is it? You know, do we need another period or do we need a comma or do we include it at all? And at the end, I think everyone felt like it was intriguing enough and there was enough evidence to keep it in the definition because that would then result in what Jenny hinted at earlier more research, more focus, more interest, and we'd be able to fill in some of the black box components that we just don't know. And every day I see something that's a, a new medication, a systemic medication usually that's being tried for something related to neuropathic pain and dry eye, whether it be something for depression or something for alcohol abuse. Both of those have you know, medications for those have been have been or are being trialed as things that might help that particular group. And eventually we're going to have to question whether or not that's its own category and doesn't even belong. It's its own. Could it be its own disease? Does it even belong in our diagram? But for now, you know, it does. And so putting it there was a, an important way of answering a question that we had longstanding had in dry eye. What do you do about the symptomatic patients where you see nothing? You know, are they pre dry eye? And that's one option. Or are they perhaps this neurosensory pain condition in which, you know, the symptoms way outweigh what you see clinically? And so that's, that's answered one side of the big question. And the other side of the question is, how about that patient that has just that torn up cornea? It's a mess. They should be telling you that they feel something and they're saying, no, doc. I feel okay. You know, what's happening there? Is their cornea numb? Do, are they just used to having dry eye, dry eye? And that's how they, is that really dry eye or not? And so we allowed for a pathway to that box as well so that we could decide how that was going to be treated. And if you look carefully at the diagram, you see there are dotted lines that, that then lead you to dry eye and such like that. So we wanted to have ways in which you could get to a dry diagnosis, even if you were considering these other pathways. And so it's a very, um, you know, if you think about patients that you have, you can walk your way through the algorithm and get down to the dry disease. And then we wanted it, we call it the funnel, which is the bottom half of the, di of the diagram, which is, you know, aqueous deficient and evaporative and the change in color show that there's nothing that separates the two. You're going to have a patient that has maybe one or some of both. And if you do, then what do you do to manage it? And even the color scheme of this diagram matches the color scheme of the diagnosis algorithm, such that as you're you know, going along, they're paired with one another, you have to decide how much aqueous deficiency you have or how much evaporative dry you have and treat the primary component first. And so it, it made sense to have the, the algorithms match one another in color and wording so that you could move smoothly from this kind of clinical um, diagnostic tree into the diagnostic uh, and treatment algorithm. So um, that pairing was really important in terms of the overall workshop. Well, you know that you bring up something that I would, I would think you talk about the neurosensory component, right? Which is responsible for this feedback loop between the epithelium and, and tear production sensory component of that. So let me throw out something here. Is dry eye workshop the right name for what you're talking about? Is, is dry eye the right thing we're talking no. about? No, it's not dry eye. I mean, that's why it's so important to have it there is to recognize that it's not dry eye. But you don't know that when the patient comes in, because for all intents and purposes, what they're describing is dry eye. So that's why it's really important to have these pathways, because the symptoms that the patient will describe sound very much like dry eye. But if the changes are not occurring on the surface of the eye in terms of the tear film, then there's a limit to what we can do with our tests. 
we're recognizing in with neurosensory abnormalities there's actually structural changes in the in the nerves in the in the nervous system and so no we can't necessarily do something about that but as clinicians it's critical that we recognize it so that we can then you know send the patients to the right place so that's why it's really important to have it there obviously if patients you know quite often patients through the chronicity of dry eye that can be the trigger for pushing them into this neurosensory issue and so therefore it's really important to deal with any aspect of dry eye disease that we recognize the part that we can see with the signs if there are the signs there then um, we need to manage that and use the the different management strategies we have available to us to address that but it's recognizing that there may be a component beyond that and if that exists then we cannot we can't solve that simply with the tests that we uh, with the management strategies that we have and there may be the need you know as you say Kelly for these systemic medications uh, to to manage that and that would be through generally through a pain clinic that's referral to a pain clinic for that it's it is a, a distinct from dry eye disease as a clinician you need to know your limitations you um i think one of the things that we always feel and i think particularly in ophthalmology is the the sense of your know, frustration or helplessness at not being able to fix the patient you know i mean that's going to happen if we're not actually treating the right thing and that's why it's really important to have the flow chart recognize where patients are know which part we can do and know where we can send somebody to have the other aspects you know managed the yeah, the two Scott, the I think two what you're getting at is should it be called the OSDW or the the OSDW? Well, and that, well right. that's what that is. I mean, that it would have been two hundred thousand pages instead of four hundred. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And, uh, but but, but it was so artful the way you in your classification <laughs> scheme, and I should say it's a, a flow. You know, I think a lot of people saw that and and pointed to that flow chart as the algorithm. They were calling it the algorithm, even though it looks like an algorithm with arrows and all. It's not. It's not an algorithm. The diagnostic methodology had an algorithm. Yeah. You, the yeah. flowchart was more of a classification scheme flowchart, which was so artful the way you got around the neuropathic, neurotrophic, the preclinical dry eye with that little arrow off yeah. uh, neuropathic, and but also the triaging questions and the the, the the avenues to other subtypes of OSD that were not technically dry eye disease too. So it's all it's all in there if you. You know, if you unpack it all, no, you're yeah, exactly. absolutely right, Chris. I mean, that's it. Um, and dry eye disease is one of very many you know, types of ocular surface exactly. disease. And that's what's important for us to recognize because, you know, it's about setting realistic expectations, not just for patients, but for ourselves and what we can hope to manage. And so that's, you know, when we... You know, as Kelly said, all these dotted arrows that probably make it look quite complex, but it's recognizing, you know, for example, with the patients, you know, without sensation, those with less sensation, who, you know, they may turn up just because they want to be fitted with contact lenses or they are thinking about going ahead and having surgery. And we see um, frank signs of dry eye or what we would say are our dry eye signs. We see those, but they're not symptomatic. We need to know that because they may still be managed with our you know, traditional dry eye um, management strategies. But if you're hoping to engage your patient and you know, have them get involved to improve their, their eye, you're going to take, need to take a different approach from saying, well, you need to do this because your symptoms will get better. And they're sitting there going, well, I'm fine, actually. And we're going... Okay, you're not fine. You have your know, frank signs of dry, you know, of ocular surface disease. That needs to be managed because we know if you go ahead and you know, wear contact lenses, you may not be very successful with that. You're not as successful as we'd like you to be. You go ahead and have surgery, and that may be the thing that really tips you over the edge into being massively symptomatic. It still needs to be managed. But we need to teach our patients that we're managing it for a different reason. We need to be able to show them, and we're very lucky with the technology we have now in our diagnostic tests, that we can show the patients often what we're seeing. And we can say, look at the impact this is having on your surface. We need to make a difference here. And you can show them that with treatment, that's the feedback that they get rather than being a symptomatic improvement. It's like, look at the difference I can show you on the imaging um, and how much better your ocular surface is than it, than it was before. So it's, yeah, expectations for yourself. You're not going to improve symptoms if the symptoms weren't a problem in the, at the outset, but you're hoping to improve the ocular surface. And I, I have, I have burning, I have burning questions for the three of you. Uh, so Jennifer, one of, uh, and I'm going to give them all to you once and take turns if you would. 
the approach to neuropathic neurotrophic, my clinical approach, and then when I talk to doctors about it, this is what I tell them I think they should do, and I'd love your thoughts on it. If I've got a person with stain without pain, pain without stain, so they, so they, I suspect neuropathic. I use preparacaine test. If their sensitive, if their pain goes away, then I think I can fix the ocular surface and they'll do better. It's it's peripheral neuropathy. If the pain persists, the full full on pain persists. To me, that's a pain management referral because we're dealing with something central. If it's mixed, I think I still have an opportunity. If there is ocular surface damage, to get them to be, do better. If I have a patient who's I saw this patient the other day with terrible corneal staining, beat red eyes with an OSDI score of eight, so very low symptoms. And I've been managing him for him for a while. He's rheumatoid arthritis. He has filamentary keratitis. And I sure enough, I, if I see that, that stain without pain, I'm touching a cotton wisp on the eye. And sure enough, they are numb. So I, I want to know from you if you think those are reasonable approaches and if there needs to be more research done on that. And Kelly, the MGD stuff, I'll t- I can tell you, the, what what was perceived as this bifurcation and perceived as mutually exclusive as someone who went around talking about dry disease with, and and restasis for years to doctors. I heard things like, well, the number 86 is one of the most quoted numbers, I think, in dry eye, right? So the LEMP study. I had, I had doctors tell me restasis only works 14% of the time. That was the takeaway, if 86%. Plus, somebody I know produced something called the MGD report around 2011, which brought to light evaporative dry eye. And I think even if they thought 86% was MGD, they treated it 100% if it was MGD. So I'd love your thoughts on that. And Chris, when you created the Ascaris algorithm, I'm really interested to hear your approach to those neuropathic pain patients. You've done surgery or they have neuropathic pain already. They've got a cataract. How on earth do you help that patient? What are the, the weighing factors? And so Jennifer, can I start with you on your thoughts on the neurosensory aspect? Well, certainly. Well, from your clinical testing, I think um, I think that's a reasonable approach to take, but I don't think you'll necessarily pick up all the patients that way. And it's exactly like you say, if you put in an anaesthetic drop and the patient is still experiencing pain, then you can say absolutely there is a pain issue going on there that's you know, a peripheral pain issue that we're not um, able to, to do something about. So I think that's good, but I don't think you'll necessarily pick up all of them. And if it's central, you won't, you, you won't see that. So yeah, what, what was the next question? I'm sorry, so so, so that from that aspect, that I think there's, there's some profiling that can go on with those people too. They yeah, tend yeah. to have a lot of other issues, right? So that's part of the picture. My Definitely. other question was... I think was, it's really important not to forget your other tests, though. I think it's really... You know, we know that neuropathic pain is a significant issue, but it's in a very small proportion of patients, but relatively in the big scheme of things, when you look at all of those with MGD, all of those with aqueous deficiency, and then at one end of things, we've got those patients with neuropathic pain. So it's maybe only 5% of the patients, but for those 5%, it's critical because it can be very, very severe. So you do still need to be doing all your other testing as well. I think it's important not to just lump people into a single oh, bucket. Absolutely. I think, I think <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about these, these are patients who've been to a number of doctors yeah, and they've that. been in your chair a whole bunch and you try traditional dry eye therapies and they don't get any better and they're still doing a lot of complaining and that's what I'm thinking yeah. neuropathic and when you're talking about neurotrophic you know yeah, how so. that whole aspect of the cotton corneal sensitivity to me has become an important test yeah, so the traditional test for um, official test beyond the, the, the cotton wisp is um, the Cauchy Bonnet test which is touching the eye And things have moved on a lot. And when we look at the research now, we see much more research using uh, non-invasive testing. We now use a a jet of air to um, test that. So we're learning more and more as we go through the research. But obviously in the clinical setting, we're not going to have tests like that. And therefore, I think it's a good move to use that cotton wisp. So basically, you're taking the finest finest um, you know, um, instruments you can to test the sensitivity and it's just gently touching that onto the cornea to find out if patients can feel that cotton wisp and I think that's a very useful test to do. 
there's certainly room for a, a, a practical, clinically affordable confocal microscope to image corneal nerves right now. So well, that would be good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We'd love to see something it's, like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it is still in research. Um, I mean, that was an amazing move forward when we could take confocal microscopy, something that you know we had traditionally considered as being a very much a basic science um, laboratory instrument, and that's now in the clinic so that we can image the nerves, we can see the, the cornea at a cellular level is, is quite tremendous but it does take time and it's a very expensive instrument so for the moment for the time being it does tend to get limited to certain you know more research centers but more clinical research centers we do see more and more information about it so yeah hopefully that will expand with time well i've been telling heidelberg there's room there's room for especially as as you see uh autologous serum getting more attention for neuropathic and now Oxervate for neurotrophic oyster point going for neurotrophic carotitis uh, indication should bring more awareness. And Kelly, MTD, so what, talk a little bit about, you could spend a couple of weeks talking about this, I'm sure, uh, the impact of the MGD report and that 86% study that Dr. Lemp did. Is that, how meaningful is that 86% number? Yeah, it's funny. I used to ask audiences, I would show the old, you know, classification scheme, which had the aqueous deficient or the evaporative. I had edited it and drawn like some arrows on it that showed mixed, you know, and, but I'd ask audiences, what percent do you think um, are aqueous deficient? What percent are evaporative? And I'd get 90, 10, a lot. Some, sometimes I get 80, 20. And so your number is really right, kind of in the middle of that. And then I would <laughs> follow up and say, how many of you have um, done Shermer then to determine and nobody in the audience would ever raise their hand. And so I'm, I always wondered, how did they decide that 10% of their dry patients are aqueous deficient if they never measured aqueous production? And I, I still today think it's because those were the 10% of the worst patients they had in the practice. And so those were, those were them. And how many of those patients, though, really would have some meibomian gland dysfunction? And I'd venture to say that nearly all of them would. If you really looked at all of those severe patients, they've got, you know, because of the feedback loop on the ocular surface, if you don't have water on the front of the eye, your tops of your meibomian glands are going to show some effects. The lid margin is going to change. That's going to have downstream effects on the, on the keratins and such that might block those meibomian glands. So they're going to have meibomian gland dysfunction. And surprisingly, that was 20 years ago when we published that report. It was 2011. And so when you think about a 10 year, it's been 10 years, you know, when we get into 20, 20, right? Yeah, tw no. Yeah. We're coming years. up on 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I'm coming up on, did I say that or did I say something yeah. different? Not 20. Well, not, not 20, <laughs> 10, 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. This, this year felt like about 10 of them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because 2020 seems so long, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, so 10 years since that happened, and really we've learned a lot, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions um, relative to meibomian gland dysfunction. Like, how, you know, what is happening to make the meibomian glands become obstructed? And fortunately, now we have. We've, you know, we have ways in which of imaging the meibomian glands, which we didn't have before. We have ways in which, you know, now we can express the meibomian glands, although fingertip and Q-tip still work pretty darn well, except, you know, some people like to use tools, et cetera. But people are doing it. You know, nowadays, if you ask an audience, how many of you are expressing meibomian glands, nearly everybody's raising their hand, which is wonderful because that wasn't happening 10 mm. years ago. Back then, there were like 26 clinical trials that managed to get into, you know, of level of quality and have to be considered in that document um, as, as papers and studies that had looked at treatments. And, you know, now there are many, many, many more since we have um, clinically available instrumentation that we can use in office to do you know, treatments to the meibomian gland. So that area has really drastically grown. But even as recent as the DUES-2 report, if you look at the classification part about, you know, in the, in the algorithm that you'll, I guess, is it an algorithm? Yes, it would be an algorithm, a diagnostic algorithm. It leaves you to, as the um, clinician to decide how you're going to evaluate the meibomian glands. There's a um, lack of information there. Should you be expressing? How do you grade? You know, what, what is the combination of, of tests that you need to perform in order to come up with your severity of MGD in order to be able to manage 
So I think we've learned a lot, but there's still many, many more questions um, as the technology has developed in that area. And that's exciting because now we have some options to use in addition to topical therapeutics for inflammation and, and, and that makes a nice combined approach. So we've learned a lot, but we have a lot more to go in terms of treatment of MGD. But I'm glad to see that we're looking at it in conjunction with aqueous deficiency because they really do coexist. And it's just right. how much of each does a patient have that, that becomes the question for the practitioner who's trying to decide what their first step should be. I still am in the camp that don't change everything all at once. Now, I think practitioners still want to try and do that, especially in contact lens where they'll just change everything. You kind of have to take a stepwise approach in managing dry patients to see what really is going to work. And you have to let there be enough time in order to allow something to work. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. That's where the follow-up becomes really important with all of these things. If you're making a change, you really do need to see them back and see what the impact has been um, on, on the test again to see if you've seen improvement. And the patient and education as well, Kelly. You know, it's, it's getting your patient on board and making sure they realize that it's going to take time. I think it's very easy to go, oh, you've got dry eye. We'll want you to take that away and then you'll be sorted. And they imagine that this is going to be some kind of miracle cure. And of course, it's not. It takes time for all of those treatments to take effect. So it's making sure your patient understands that and also following them up, getting, making sure they come back so that you check it, like Kelly said. You're not just saying, well, try these and disappear and I'll expect not to see you again. Expect to see your patient, you know, tell them what you want them to do. Tell them it's going to take a period of time and you're wanting to see that difference after a month after they've tried something before you'll, you'll see them back. Um, I think it's very great important. Point. Great point. Um, but, and, yeah, and Chris, but, well, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jennifer. No, I was just going to talk to the point that Kelly said about the, the testing for MGD. I think that's a really important thing. And I think that's something we'll see, should we ever get to TFOS Juice 3, we'll be uh, trying to get the, the clinical endpoints better for, MG, you know, for um, evaporative dry eye disease. And it's not because we don't know that all these tests exist. Obviously, they're, they're written down in this one, but it's just that lack of evidence. And we're seeing more and more. It's pleasing to see the, the, the research that's coming out now because at the moment, people are kind of using... So for um, aqueous deficient dry eye, we've got our Shermer test. But even if you're not going to do something as invasive as that, because we do know that's a very invasive test, we should be looking at the tear meniscus. That's one thing we can look at non-invasively. You don't touch the patient. Nobody's touched their tear film. And if you can image that and measure that, that will give you some indication. That's a good index of the volume of tears on the surface of the eye. So that's nice and easy for aqueous deficient. Then people use anything else that's not aqueous deficient as being evaporative. So that makes it very difficult to then compare different studies if people are using different measures. Um, for assessing a, uh, an evaporative dry eye. So one of the tests that we use now is mybography. We can use infrared mybography, and a lot of people have that in clinical practice now, which is fantastic. But that's morphological. That will tell us what the state of the glands look like, whether there are glands present or not. You know, It's not actually necessarily telling us accurately what the function is like. And that's why, as Kelly said, we need to be expressing the glands. We need to see how expressible the glands are. You may have many glands, but if you can't express them because there's so much keratinization, for example, blocking the glands, then you wouldn't see that. So it's important to express them. And then the other tests we have are things like the looking at the lipid layer on the surface of the eye. And some of our instruments will allow us to look with interferometry at that now. And that will actually show you how the lipid layer is functioning on the surface of the eye. So I think there are, there are many components and, and it's now our job within research, I guess, to work out how those should be um, put together in order to make a good diagnosis of an evaporative dry eye or one you know, for my bone and gland dysfunction specifically. Chris, when you were developing your algorithm for Oscar's uh, pre-surgical evaluation, how important was this new definition in your, in your approach? Yeah, well, there would be no Oscar's algorithm without the TFOS2 classification schema and algorithm before. And in fact, that's, I intentionally waited for TFOS to, uh, to come out and so I could scrutinize it before kind of adapting the, me the uh, methodology for a surgical patient specifically, which is what Ascaris was all about. I had so many things I wanted to say, but I didn't want to interrupt uh, any of you. But Kelly, when you were ta talking about the evaporative versus aqueous efficient and the percentages and all that, if you really look at the, at the dues report, which you all have, 
but most other people haven't. You know, it does say in there uh, that that the committee was struggling a little bit because it, really the conclusion was all dry eye becomes evaporative at some point, all of it, whether it starts mm-hmm. out purely aqueous deficient at some point in that spectrum, it's going to end up as evaporative. And there was a, some th- talk about calling it hyper, call, distinguishing evaporative, hyper evaporative. And then I, I guess everybody realized this is too fundamentally different from what everybody is already aware of aqueous division versus uh, evaporative. And so that was kind of abandoned, although it was entertained. But it is important to note that that most of it becomes evaporative at some point. Um, And if you read the small print, we do have hyper evaporation in there. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and similarly, uh, uh, what you were talking about, about the morphological test, like my biography, which is anatomic, yes, but confocal in a lot of ways is the same. You know, if you, Mm -hmm. you can measure the quantify the corneal nerves and measure them, but it doesn't necessarily translate to neurotrophic or neuropathic or what have you. Similarly, OCT of uh, optic nerves. You know, you can have a lot of loss with a normal visual field, a normal function, a normal vision, just like you can have a lot of decrease in corneal density, but have normal corneal sensation. So they're useful tests, but they're not the full picture. And as you said, going forward, we'll, we'll learn more and TFOS DUS3, we'll probably have a lot more information and a lot more research on that. As far as the uh, ASCRIS, uh, the surgical algorithm that we did, what was your question, Scott? <laughs> well, I, I mean, what t- uh, my question oh, was really a, cu- yeah. a couple things. Um, 100% dependent on, on, on TFOS uh, DUS2, but adapted slightly for the context of the surgical patient. And so if a, fun- a couple fundamental differences. One, the, uh, uh, we were looking for visually significant ocular surface disease. It wasn't technically just dry eyes. So that's why our, our methodology was a little bit different. We did include inflammation in, in sort of the essential uh, uh, tests, whereas TFOS2 didn't. You know, and to me, inflammation, MMP9 is the, the easy one that we have here, is a nonspecific inflammatory marker. It's elevated in a whole bunch of ocular surface disorders, many of which can have implications with surgery and affect surgical outcomes and possibly surgical infections refractive outcomes and things like that. Uh, so that's why MMP9 was kind of included in, in our uh, methodology. Neuropathic and neurotrophic were in there, but that's, I give 100% credit to the TFOS, your classification scheme for me kind of putting that in mind. One of the mis- and it's so funny when you put these things out into the world and you know, you've got, in our sense, it was the asterisk out, it was the cornea clinical committee. So it was a consensus. It wasn't as big as TFOS. But, you know, you work on it for years and you have it, it all sounds great in your head and you pu- publish it and you put it out there. And then, of course, you know, the, the real world starts nipping at it and uh, dissecting it and start taking things out of context and blah, 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 blah. Just like TFOS and, and the dues one and two, two reports and things like osmol- you need osmol- hyperosmolarity to call it dry eye. You know, that's the definition says it. And that's why you have all these after the, you know, afterwards. You, no, no, we didn't mean that. That's not what we meant. One of the things in the Ascaris algorithm was this neuropathic situation. Now, uh, most of what we were getting at with the Ascaris algorithm was, uh, it was mostly designed for cataract, overwhelmingly the, the biggest you know, refractive surgery that, that we do in the United States and worldwide. Uh, and laser vision correction was you know, a smaller part of that. So in the neuropathic section, I, it, when something did come up afterwards. Well, they say if there's neuropathic pain, it's fine to, to go ahead and do surgery. And it, that is true in the case of cataract, where, you know, it's not going to necessarily impact, you know, the, there's no staining. So the cornea is pristine, you're going to get accurate keratometry and accurate topography and you'll accurate eye well calculation. But it should certainly be identified and discussed. You know, if you diagnose an ocular surface disorder, whether it's corneal or dry eye or MGD or whatever it may be, uh, it very well can be impacted by surgery and it can get worse. And so if you have a patient with neuropathic pain, yes, you're going to do cataract surgery. You don't need to delay. You don't need to treat the surface per se because the surface is already healthy. Uh, but you should identify it and talk to the patient. This might get worse. You know, we have treatments for this, blah, 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 blah. In the case of laser vision correction, and this is where some of the misconceptions came out after the fact, and it wasn't clear enough in the, the flow chart, the algorithm, that of course nobody would do recommend laser vision correction on a patient with neuropathic pain. 100% no, 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 no. It is a contraindication 100%. It wasn't worded enough, at least it wasn't in the algorithm. So some people jumped on that. Oh, I can't believe they 
recommend surgery, LASIK on a neuropathic patient. Absolutely not. I just want to clarify that. And then the neurotrophic, you know, obviously that is a completely different scenario. And that has very significant visual significance when you have a corneal beat up cornea with staining and ir irregular uh, astigmatism. And, and you, there's no way to get an accurate IOL calculation on that. And that needs to be treated beforehand and discussed with the patient, even if they don't have pain or symptoms of discomfort. What else? Was there anything else that you had asked me? Did I those were the those were the main things. I think okay. we all know, and we're probably I'm no I, I know I'm guilty of it. I'm looking at I'm looking at a diagram. I'm I'm not necessarily as going to read the fine print, and we yeah. all we all embrace diagrams, and so that's I can imagine you got a little bit beat up on that. So sorry <laughs> to hear it, but you can make it publicly known here. Do not do. A LASIK on a neuropathic pain 100%, patient. One hundred percent. All right, <laughs> it's official. Jennifer, let me ask you um, some controversial things that may have been in the new definition. Uh, and so, first of all, from a practitioner standpoint, you know, during pandemic, especially the more and more virtual our world becomes, I am seeing in practice many more young kids coming in with dry eye symptoms. I'm out. I'm having them ask their parents to bring them in because their eyes are bothering them. It's not just the decrease in blink rate, but it's the decrease in blink uh, quality and complete partial blinks mm -hmm. uh, driving a lot of the problem. When you put inflammation into the definition, do, do kids, do, does a younger population end up with manifest or, or inflammation slower than an older patient might? Well, that's a good question. I guess, yeah, I mean, when, you're, when we're talking about inflammation in that context, it's a downstream effect. It's not being driven by inflammation. What's happening is you're, you're developing an unstable tear film is probably one of the, the first points. So like you say, with lots of digital screen use, when we concentrate on a screen, we don't blink as often, but we also don't blink as completely. People are partially blinking. Um, and as you're doing that, obviously the tear film doesn't get replenished properly, with every, restructured with every blink and you get instability. Um, and with that instability, um, the, obviously the tears evaporate more quickly and that's how they become hyperosmolar. Um, and then you, you end up with that inflammation. So whether it happens more slowly, I guess it just all happens as part of that vicious cycle. And so patients are ending up in that vicious circle of dry eye disease, probably driven by the instability more than anything else. And then it, that results in inflammation. But the important thing to remember is that shouldn't be treated with an anti-inflammatory. That's not the cause of the problem. You need to try and treat the patient at source. You know, if you rush in and give them an anti-inflammatory, of course they're going to be happy because you've got rid of everything. You've masked everything. It's a blunderbuss treatment that just masks anything that's going on. But if you, if, especially for somebody like a child, you wouldn't want to do that because you can change the problem at source. For example, the digital screen use, if you can encourage better blinking so that the eyes close properly, um, so that if there is any um, sign of meibomian gland dysfunction, any of that is treated, any signs that you can see, if you can treat that at source, then the inflammation will go away by itself. You just get back, you feed back out of that vicious circle as you entered into the vicious circle. If you improve the stability, then the tears don't evaporate so quickly, then you don't end up with inflammation or ocular surface damage. So that you're trying to reverse that cycle. So yeah, so I guess it depends on why you have the dry eye. If you've got somebody with an older person, for example, or somebody with autoimmune disease, where there is actually an inflammatory component driving the dry eye, then in that case, you're going to need, um, you're going to develop your inflammation more dramatically and more quickly than in somebody for whom um, inflammation is not the driving factor. So I think it's it just shows us how important it is to be testing all different aspects of dry eye and not trying to immediately put people into a single box. It's understanding that there are different components and managing those as they arise. But certainly not just rushing in and treating with an anti-inflammatory for something like that. Well, you know, I, I, often, I often go around quoting this study, which had a fairly small N, and I'm not sure about the methods and how reliable the study was, where there were six different media types used to look at blink rates, and they decided it was cognitive demand that drove decrease in blink rate. But in electronic devices, there were more partial blinks with some theories. Do you have theories on why there are more partial blinks with electronic devices and are there really good blink analysis studies other than that small study? 
we're there's we're gaining more information about it. I mean, I'm not sure we do fully understand it. It's a, it's a complex process, but certainly if you compare people reading a book and looking at a device, they will blink less reading looking at the device. And I don't know. I mean, it, certainly it's cognitive, but I don't know if it's the the fear of missing out. Is it the the speed, the way in which we look at it? You know, you've got scrolling. You know, with a book, your your eyes are following the text, which stays. Still, whereas often with um, devices we're watching scrolling text, it's, it's a different way of looking at material. And in doing that, and I mean, it's not just gaming, it's in everything that we do, there's this fear of missing out. <laughs> Don't blink, you might miss something, you know, if it's going fast enough. And I, I guess it's partly to do with that. Um, and it's, I, I guess, a, 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 I'd say a laziness, but it's not a conscious thing. You know, it's like, what can I get away with? You know, if, I, if I only partially blink, I can manage to not miss any text and I can still get away with it. But no, the problem that is looks like it's causing a problem. We still need a lot more research in this area. It's, it's certainly not definitive, but we do. We are seeing an increasing um, literature that shows the problems with digital screens and the impact that has on blinking. And I mean, we, the personal research we've been doing at the university has shown that if you look at the natural history of dry eye, it looks like it draws right back to blinking and a lack of blinking. One of the first signs that you see in young people is um, incomplete blinking. And that carries on throughout all the different stages of dry eye. Um, and then other things get added in. So as you, if you have incomplete begin, uh, blinking to begin with, then patients are still not symptomatic. There's enough of a buffer in this, in the, in, you know, there's enough capacity in the system to cope with that for a period of time before patients start to become symptomatic. And then as they become symptomatic, then you see the signs starting to appear later and later. And then it comes down to your, eventually you start to see the stain that stain happens in much older people, but it may be that we're actually what we're seeing is something that's happening from very early on, which is a really interesting concept because then perhaps there's something we can do to try and slow down dry eye, the development of dry eye with time. And I mean, that's something we're looking at, but it needs a lot more research in this area. We can do a study on this video. We'll just go rewind back to the beginning and count all, all the number all of blinks. blinks. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no. That's super interesting. Um, great conversation. I've not really thought of some of this all the way through. We did a study where we looked at kids, like 250 kids, and looked at their like tear film parameters. And, and they're all relatively normal, even those that um, – said that they used a lot of screen time. And then when you do look at the dry eye group, which is a small group of, this is all comers. So it's a fairly small group of the whole group of 250. Um, but it is interesting that there's such redundancy in the system when you're young. And then as you age, you lose some of that redundancy. You know, some of your myeloma glands drop out, other things happen. And so that may be why you get to the point, Jenny, where, as Jenny mentioned, mm -hmm. where you see the staining after a while and it isn't a long-term effect, a, a history of life perhaps, um, and systemic disease and systemic inflammation that probably, and, and these things are super hard to tease out in any clinical work and, and research because there's so multifactorial aspects that are happening, it's hard to know what questions to even ask that are the ones that are gonna make the difference in the study. But fascinating about the scrolling versus book reading. I think that'll be really interesting to see yeah. over time if that really points to a difference in our habits and what we see on the eyes. Yeah. Interesting. But what you're saying, Kelly, about the meibomian glands, so I was saying you get that incomplete blinking at a very young age. You still have complete meibomian gland, a complete set of meibomian glands at that point, but later on you start to see meibomian gland drop out, but you still don't see maybe a few symptoms, um, but not major symptoms, and you don't see the signs until much later because there has been research out there that says you, you only really need about 45% of your meibomian glands working at any one time. So the point at which you tip yourself over the edge until into feeling those symptoms, perhaps you were looking at it a little bit too late. We need to be doing something much, much earlier on. So, That's yeah, compounded yeah. by the fact that we've never had a good natural history study of dry eye. Yeah. So that I know. And everything I've mentioned is about snapshots at different ages. And there are always going to be limitations there because the different ages of people are going to have been exposed to different things in their lives. So the, that older age group that we're looking at didn't have that massive you know, digital screen exposure that um, our young people are having today. So perhaps what we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing a trajectory of developing dry eye. 
that has the potential to be very much worse if we're looking at a, a, a digital group from a young, a young age and seeing how they carry on through. So what we're needing are better longitudinal studies. We need to be seeing the same people and following them through over time. And that's what a number of us are, are doing now is trying to follow, the, follow people up over time and seeing what you would expect to see uh, in the eye over years. TFOS dues three. Right, right. Oh, I think right. we'll be on to TFOS Juice 6 by then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, is, it is fascinating though because I know a lot of people, ever, and it says it in the, in the report, you know, a lot of, pe- a lot of us assume mm-hmm. it's progressive and chronic, oh, but right. the evidence is just not strong enough to have had included those words in the definition or in, you know, a strongly worded statement within the TFOS Juice 2 uh, anywhere, uh, pathophysiology or what have you. So yes, we need we need more data on that. That's correct. Yes, we we did discuss that. We yeah. kind of wanted it to be there as clinicians. Yeah. We felt that was there, but you're absolutely right. I mean, TFOS Juice Two is based on the evidence that's already published, so it couldn't go in at that point. But I think we're growing more and more evidence to support that suspicion. Yeah. yeah. And and putting you both on the spot here, Jennifer, and I I don't know if you care to comment on this or not, but if you if you could. Are there aspects of this new definition that in the last three years you might modify um, based on the latest research? I think, well, I mean, possibly, like you say, I mean, the chronicity and um, the fact that it's progressive is possibly something that may go into um, a definite definition in future. I guess that would be based mostly on my bone gland dysfunction. So I'd like to see that kind of redefined first before we see the, the main definition redefined. I think, in terms of problems with it, I think people are struggling with the fact that we've used, we've gone with this blanket ocular symptoms, which, as I described before, was because we didn't want to tie it only to uh, discomfort and visual disturbance, even though we recognise those are the main things. I guess that's something that people have struggled with and really want the visual disturbance. Put me there, they're like, I don't know why they took visual disturbance out because that's really important. It's like we didn't take it out. We've kept it in. We've just used a bigger term to describe all of the different symptoms that people can have. So I'm not sure if that would be something that I, I would change. But no, I, I don't think so. I think it's it's still... A very current definition. I think it, it recognises the the important parts. I just think we need we will as we um, see more evidence appearing with the literature that's becoming available. I guess we'll just hone in on that and make sure that those are important. And what we'll do in five years and ten years, whenever you know TFOS dues next TFOS dues three occurs, is we'll be looking at the evidence. It's all about the evidence, seeing how that changes things around, but. Currently, it's not too bad. It's, it's a little wordy, but I think it was important to cover everything we needed to, to say in it. Well, with an explosion in innovation in the ocular surface world from device and pharmaceutical companies, I imagine a lot more research is coming. What about you, Kelly? Anything you would, you would like to see your learnings since 2017 that you might change? Yeah, yeah, I love Jenny's comments. Um, those were all things that we considered, you know, when we were making the definition. And no, I actually like the definition the way it is because we made it so that it would be would have longevity. We didn't want to have to redo the definition because once you have a disease, you want to learn more about what happens behind the scenes, but the words should stay the same. And that's where we felt that homeostasis and loss of homeostasis was a, was a critical phrase that could stand the test of time, so to speak. And so um, I think we'll learn more behind the scenes. And, you know, it would be nice to actually demonstrate what we think clinically, that it is chronic and progressive. We don't know how progressive or, you know, how chronic it is. But I think that those are important things that usually are part of a description of a disease state, particularly the chronic part. But all this does really, um, the definition impacts you mentioned there's a lot of interest in the space right now, and you're right. And that's largely because there's been a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of forward movement with therapeutics and diagnostics. And because of that, then, then more companies want to get into that space and, and realize an unmet need of patients and an unmet need in terms of treatments. So, you know, and that then rolls back down to the definition because regulatory agencies look at definitions in order to decide what needs to be done, what, what bar needs to be met in order to 
approve a therapeutic or a diagnostic. And so the words in the definition matter for that. You know, signs and symptoms are, it's, you know, dual outcomes are measured in dry eye studies because they've both been in the definition. And, um, and that's persisted. And so we had those discussions as well as we crafted the definition. And as we mentioned earlier, osmolarity and inflammation, you know, there was a worry that if you put those two, the period, you know, if you put those two things without a period, are they going to have to be measured in every clinical trial? Depends. It depends on what the mechanism of action is of the therapeutic that's being tested. So, you know, you do, you do have to match those things in designing a clinical trial, but it is critically important that it you know, starts with a strong definition that can stand the test of time. Otherwise, how do you start a, a dry eye program knowing that when you finish it five or eight years later, there's a new definition that we want the same definition to persist over a period of time so that the industry can move forward to help the patients. You know, that's what it's really all about in the end is coming up with new innovations so that you can better diagnose, manage, and perhaps treat earlier or detect earlier so that you can help the, the whole life of that patient and the quality of life, as you mentioned, Scott. So I'm happy with the definition as it is. Um, I know we're going to learn more behind the scenes, but hopefully that won't result in word changes that, um, that, that make us have to change our mind of what we're actually setting. I think we really know now what we're setting. And um, I'm pleased with the outcome of the definition and classification scheme. Unless some mm. breakthrough diagnostic comes along or some breakthrough study. <laughs> yeah, you know, we still don't have that gold standard <laughs> diagnostic test, you know. And so when we're trying to figure out what truth is when you're doing all, you know, sensitivity, specificity, area under the curve, all of that, we, we don't, we have to still define what we're calling truth. So, you know, we're, I don't know that we're ever going to have one test, but ultimately what you want is you want a test that can be done and a paired treatment so that if you measure the test and you see a high level of whatever it is, and then you have a treatment that lowers whatever that is or, or, or raises it, whichever direction you need to go, and they're paired with one another, then you can actually know that you have a quantifiable change that you can talk to the patient about. And of course, then that should match with an improvement in symptoms. Yeah, so I think that's, that's really important because, I mean, when we look at our tests, and I mean, you, I know you're going to be running podcasts on the uh, diagnostic methodology, and they'll go into that in much more detail in the way in which that's done. But the way we diagnose is we use the kind of what we describe as global tests, and those tests are the instability, the osmolarity, you could say inflammation, we don't use that in ours, um, or ocular surface damage. Those are features that will occur in every single patient ultimately with a dry eye. It doesn't tell you why they have dry eye. It simply tells you that they have a dry eye. So symptoms plus any one of those signs will tell you you've got a dry eye. What we need to do is then do these other tests in order to find out why, because it's exactly like Kelly says, our you know, what we need to do is address the lack of homeostasis. We need to get rebalance into the tear film. And to do that, you need to address whatever went wrong. So we need all those other, we need those other tests in order to find out what's gone wrong in order to then be able to um, manage that homeostasis in order to restore homeostasis. So it's complex. I don't think we're going to get down to one test. You could use one test. You could say, you know, so if somebody can be diagnosed on the basis of symptoms plus instability, that will allow us to say, yes, you have a dry eye, but it won't let us know why you have the dry eye. So I don't think we'll ever get down to a single test that will match with the treatment. Those, uh, you know, that's where you need to then break it down and then you'll have the different tests matching with the different treatments, as Kelly says, but that's a, ne a level below having just made your diagnosis. So very good. Lots of testing needed. Very good. Very good. Well, all of you, I, uh, Chris and I, we, we appreciate your participation today and uh, congrats on a fine body of work. I often hear D TFOS dues to referred to as the encyclopedia of dry eye disease. I, not too many days go by before. I mean, I, I'm always hearing quotes and always learning new things. It's such a large body of work. So congrats to both of you and congrats to you, Jennifer, on your professorship. And I <laughs> will revisit with you later, but I know you're going to be heading up the next TFOS workshop looking at lifestyle impact, which <clears throat> is, a, is a big deal, which we kind of touched on That's a little right. bit with device use today. So thank you all. And uh, I hope you all join us for our next uh, episode, which will feature Dr. David Sullivan talking about the sex, gender, and hormone part of TFOS Dues 2.
So thanks everybody for listening today. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Join us for our next episode soon. Find us online at www.ocularsurfaceacademy.com, all major podcast platforms, and YouTube. Lacrimetics, providing proven dry eye disease treatment options since 1984. Contact us now.